Hello. Uh, <laughs> Steve and I were just doing our um, uh, theatrical warm up exercises, and we feel like we're in good voice right now. Welcome back to what is it, 18th? Is this the 18th, Steve? This is number eight. This is, wait, let's see. Number 18. Number oh, 18. Wait, hold on. Number 18. Woo! Yes, number 18. And we've got an amazing webinar for you. It is a record breaker in terms of registration. Um, and with real no surprise, because we have two amazing, amazing people that are going to be on lions or lionesses of the field, as we may call them, um, in thinking about what works um, and how do we actually wrap our heads around a creative process, which also is about transforming the way that we think, we feel, we do. And how do we know if it does work? Um, and so we've got two people on which we're gonna introduce right now. That was a cue. We're gonna introduce right now. Right now. We're introducing oh, there they go. Oh, yes. And um, here they are. And it, on the left is Jan Cohen Cruz, who is a longtime scholar, expert, wonderful, amazing person who's been looking at the intersection of culture and politics. I've read her books, been super influential on how I think, but she doesn't have to take uh, any of the heat for that. Um, and on <laughs> right is um, Deborah Fisher. Um, and Jan Cohen Cruz is the director of field research, and Deborah Fisher is the executive director of Blade of Grass. Um, they're going to tell you a little bit about Blade of Grass, but we're just going to do the pitch for it is Blade of Grass, which is really something that Deborah Fisher put together on her kitchen table. Uh, no, it wasn't in the kitchen table, but in any case, is the premier institution for supporting arts and activism. Um, it really does what no other groups do insofar as it really understands what people who are trying to combine arts and activism are trying to do and bring them to the next level. So thank you, first of all, for both of you for being on our webinar. Um, and yeah, so what is a blade of grass? That's a cue to me. Hi, everybody. My name is Deborah Fisher. I'm the executive director of A Blade of Grass. And uh, A Blade of Grass is the first arts organization that only supports socially engaged art. And uh, so that means artists who are enacting a social change. We see a, a little bit of a difference between socially engaged art and, uh, and creative activism. I'm also, among other things, a uh, proud board member of the Center for Artistic Activism, right? So, um, so I feel qualified to make um, to make an assessment yeah, about, remarks. Huh? about both of those things. Uh, so a Blade of Grass supports socially engaged art through an annual open call uh, for a fellowship program. The fellowship program gets about 500 applications from the, around the country every single year, and we choose eight fellows to work with. Those eight fellows get um, uh, a film made about what a film made about their project, participatory action research by Jan Cohen Cruz, uh, and other types of content that shares the project with a wide variety of audiences. Uh, in addition to that, there's a twenty thousand dollar stipend uh, so that artists can live and do their work. That is a blade of grass, right? And the projects are projects. Um, are always, there's always art, although you might not know that, you might not see that. It might be art in the way that the artist approaches the work mm -hmm. um, in a kind of a process. And it might be very exploratory. Um, in other situations, it might have a very strong goal. And so we do we do support some projects that are creative activism and then other, other projects that we would call part of a kind of a larger, more exploratory feel of socially engaged. And one of the key goals in our work is definitely to understand how socially engaged art works so that we can advocate for more artists working in non-art contexts. Mm. So this is something, I'm glad you brought that up because since Steve and I started this about nine years ago, I mean, we're total boosters of the connection between arts and activism, but we're also kind of skeptics, right, Steve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it started from skepticism, me as an artist, Steve, kind of as an activist, both seeing projects and hoping that they worked. But, you know, ultimately, we, we were on a call yesterday where, where they were like, yes, and they'll transform people's vision and their attitudes. And I'm like, and policy, 
right? Like we want to change policy too. And that skepticism of like, is this really doing anything? Um, and that was always the marker for me. And I think Steve had a, a similar skepticism about the organizing work that he was doing. Yeah, and so how do you, you folks have been doing this longer than we have, and you've been probably thinking about this deeper than anybody has. How do you approach this question of um, assessing or even, you know, asking the question of how this work works? Yeah. I mean, one thing I'd say is that we look at each project individually. We don't have one template for knowing how it works. They take place over such different time frames. The how it works for who? You know, who's right. meant to benefit? Who are the multiple um, players? Um, the other thing I would say is that you know when we're thinking about how socially engaged art works, we're thinking about it in an art, in the context of an arts institution, right? Mm -hmm. A blade of grass is is an arts is an arts organization. So. You know, we're including um, effects or effectiveness that can be entirely on the symbolic register. Um, it can be very much about. Um, it, it doesn't have to. It, it doesn't have to change policy directly. In the case of socially engaged art, yeah, and sometimes it's important that the project um, represents or enacts a kind of alternative. It doesn't mean that alternative is ready to be embraced all over the world. But you've got to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and some of what we uh, some of what we support does have very specific activist goals. And yeah. when we get into the images a little later, uh, we'll be happy to point out which ones do have goals that are closer to policy change mm -hmm. um, and those that are that's not one of the metrics that we would apply. Yeah. I mean, because one of the things that we're really interested in articulating is how art is changing, how art is being integrated into daily life more what that integrated art world could look like, right? That's the art world. We perceive that as the art world of the future, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean, um, uh, that doesn't always mean a direct policy change, but it does mean how is this work working? So that's a slightly different question for us. Yeah, and so then we also care a lot about, well, who's the audience? Who wants to know how yeah. it's working? And that yeah. really changes how we approach it because they have their needs. So for example, in the work we do with the Department of Cultural Affairs here in New York City and their PEAR project, the Public Artists in Residence, where artists are embedded in these various agencies. You know, this year, some just yesterday, I saw a presentation of the artist who's embedded in the um, Commission for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So what that commissioner ultimately needs to know about what happens this year with that artist, um, that commissioner will spend not the same amount of time as we will poring over uh, what happened. And so we really have to hit a certain points that are how they need to be able to talk about the work to keep going yeah do you want to speak a little bit more about the pair assessments and um and how that's turning into a municipal toolkit i think that's yeah. actually a really good example of yeah what we're doing of your work thank you and yeah. I, and and it is it's it's really exciting in terms of art being integrated in everyday life the fact that there are cities all across the country not just here in new york but um, in our research, uh, we've got an Our Town grant along with Pam Corza and Barbara Schaefer Bacon of Animating Democracy to look at how artists are being embedded in municipalities all across the country. Um, and so that's just a, that's a great way to to get art um, part of social context, whatever yeah. social context is meaningful and in whatever kind of way. And, and to look at all those variations, we're not interested in saying here is the best practice. We're interested in seeing here are the here's a set of choices that municipalities and artists are making and what makes them work or not work given the context. What are the challenges that come up or what then happens smoothly and how much seems to do with the actual players? You know, mm -hmm. if you've got this commissioner, what's possible is very different than if you have this commissioner yeah. or this artist or this context or this historical moment. So how do you look at all those things together? So one of the things it, it seemed like the take one of the takeaways is there is no blanket solutions. It's all about specificities and it's all about contexts. So maybe we can actually look at a couple of examples and you can actually lead us through like who was the audience, who was the artist, what were they trying to do, and kind of tease it out on that that uh, granular level. 
Sure. Yeah. So this first project is um, a project that we did in our first year. It's Jody Wood is the artist name. And the project is called Beauty in Transition. The uh, the project itself was Jody basically created a uh, a mobile uh, beauty salon and then partnered with a number of homeless shelters in Brooklyn and Manhattan to provide uh, to provide hair hairstyling services to homeless women in the shelters and there were some key differences between an a, a sort of an existing service uh, there are a lot of services that will provide haircuts to every single person in the homeless shelter so that they get their hair cut it's a it's a basic need um, but this was operating in a very different way and had a very different set of goals um, it, because what Jody was really thinking about was the relationship um, and the lack of agency right between the care worker be between the people who are caring for homeless women in these shelters and the homeless women themselves uh, do you want to talk more about your yeah yeah, yeah. and so um when jody approached hairstylists and asked would they come and do free hairstyling and have the conversation with the woman to figure out what did they want um one thing that so it, it was often very meaningful to the hairstylist because a lot of people want to contribute something and it's very different to contribute something using what you're trained in like hairstyling um versus you know you're serving turkey at at thanksgiving and there's nothing wrong with that it's just when you give something that's much more of yourself there's a kind of intimacy in the touch that was very important to jody what it is to be cared for no matter what situation you're in what that experience is for those women um, and so part of what I get to do is I get to follow a project over it. This was maybe a three month project, three or four months. Um, I get to talk to people. I get to talk to some of the women who get their hair done, some of the other people who are watching this transformation from when they walk into the, the, the little, the, the little hair salon truck and they walk out to the hairstylist etc and find out from their point of view what's going on and mm -hmm. i always hear things that are that are different from what the artist hears um just partly because of the chance of the moment or because people tend to be very grateful but there's certain things they're afraid they might be offending if they say so it allows me to be in a conversation with the artist part of our idea of does it work is being in an ongoing iterative conversation with the artist not waiting for the end to evaluate something and let you hear right. oh here's what we learned well it's too late too bad good luck next time but right. all we go along so that you can course correct yeah. um, as you go. And that's very important. Also, goals sometimes change. There are things the artists learn because it is a research project. We're not being coy when we call it field research rather than calling it assessment. There is a piece of field research is saying to the artist, what is it that you're trying to do? And saying to the hairstylist, why did you agree to do this? And then find out if that's happening. So there are things being measured, but that's not the whole story. And we want to get a, sort of a bigger story. And that involves research moving forward. And it's a kind of trust we place in the artists we support. If you're eight of, of, of 500 artists who apply, then you you probably have been at it for a while. You're probably on to something worthwhile. It doesn't always work, but that's not bad. So the point is, well, well what are we learning here? Where were the obstacles? Where is it mm -hmm. moving forward? Might this be a good way to go? It allows me or other field researchers who work with us to be in a kind of a conversation which we think is more generative. Yeah. And that kind of thing artists can use also, right? Like you don't you don't need a Jan Cohn Cruz to to do that. No. You can do a bit of it on your own. One thing actually that uh, Tom Finkel Pearl, who's now the Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner in New York City, he used to be on our board and one of and one of the things that he said as we were putting this fellowship together that I thought was really um, helpful was the idea that he was just like, well, I would love to see artists um, who are doing socially engaged work start to um, uh, do their assess do a kind of assessment or evaluation for one another as a part of documentation. Similarly to the way that, you know, when I was a, working as a sculptor, you know, like my photography friends would take slides from me and I would build their crates, you know? So, there's part of me, um, you know, I think I lean more towards the artistic activism side that would say, uh, or there's a voice, right? That's like, all right, so if you have a bunch of better looking homeless people that feel better about themselves, that's good. But if they're in the end still homeless, right? Yeah. That would be one measure. 
that might not be the best measure for this project. In fact, it's not relevant to the artist, right? And that's why that artist makes that project and I would make something else. But can we go back just for a second and maybe talk a little bit more about like, what do you think, now that we have this project as an example, what is the difference between socially engaged art and artistic activism? Yes, uh, so Jody reached, um, like, so, so, Jody's thinking about this in in a uh, in a larger context of a body of work that's about care, intimacy, and trauma, right? Like, so she's really thinking very specifically in an exploratory way about what's the relationship between the care uh, the caregiver and the person who's being cared for, and what is gained and what is lost in that transaction, right? Um, so. What she's doing is actually just an embodiment of her practice with other people. So she's not um, she's not hoping necessarily to end homelessness by giving people um, hair care. Yeah. What yeah. is she trying to do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's all she's also very wary of how institutionalized any of her methods become. You know, there have been various groups um, that want to support people in this situation that have been interested in her work. And she's a little careful because there's something kind of amazing about just pulling up in this little truck that when you go inside it, it's a hair salon, um, that it changes the atmosphere. And even though it's a, just a temporary moment, right. she feels everyone should get that experience. And, it, and, it, and, and it's got to be, it's important to look at, as Deborah said, really, in relationship to Jody's ongoing work, Rather in relate, rather than in relationship to the issue of homelessness. So, That's and and the thing that she's actually trying to affect change on. So, uh, you know, when I visited uh, one of the shelters in Bushwick, right? Like, so one of the most interesting things that happened to me in the course of kind of watching this project was a care um, a caregiver came up to me and was just like, "This is an amazing project because see that woman right there? She is getting a haircut." that I know she can't take care of. And it is driving me crazy right now. And I have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, and I'm like, yeah, she's like, and that is why this pro project is important. This is showing me something about where I work. Mm -hmm. And and like, there's a, there's a clarity around that, but it's also very intimate and it has nothing to do with solving homelessness. It has to do with how we value care and, and the contours of care itself. Mm -hmm. I could see where, Go ahead. As a funder, that if Jody was partnered with the wrong funder, the wrong funder would have the one standard be, do we have less people living on the street? Right. right? And this, um, you know, might not be a good match. No. Um, and so I think, well, one thing, it's great that you exist um, for things like this. But, um, and I don't know how much we want to get into this. We could stem yeah. it if you want but how would somebody uh like an artist like present like these are the these are the um objectives i'm trying to reach right and reframe right. that well she so so you know one of the reasons that jody got a fellowship was because she was actually really clear about her objective she was um she wrote about this work in the context of um, a larger body of work that's about these things, right? Like, so, and then, you know, in doing the assessment, she was very wary of, uh, because we still call it assessment at that, at that time, this is 2014, right? And, um, and we didn't learn that we were actually doing field research yet. So, um, so one of the things that she was really wary of is this idea of qualita uh, qualitative research, sorry, quantitative research, um, in for her projects, because like only about 111, something like that. You know, like women were uh, were in the chair getting their hair done uh, over the course of three months. But the thing that made the project work was that they got whatever they wanted. So if they wanted six hours of like of like really intense braids, they got six hours of really intense braids. If they needed to get their hair colored, if they need like whatever, like they got whatever they asked for. And that in that perception of agency was the point of the project. So um, so you know, thinking through that with her and thinking about things like, you know, maybe it's about like how long each person is 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 there. Mm. You know, like maybe that's a, a more appropriate quantitative metric. 
or maybe it's more important to really focus just on the stories of the people that are coming out of it, right? Um, there's something very interesting with shelter workers. Um, it's this thing of trying to get who are the various different players who, who are affected in any way by a given project. And so the people who worked in the shelters that, where the truck went that I spoke with um, said how it changed the feeling, um, the atmosphere of the place for the day. Mm -hmm. And that was a very good thing to be reminded of, that it's very hard work. I know because my husband did it for many years in the shelter. And, um, and you can, you can really get into some very bad habits and stereotypes in how you do the work. So to have a moment where something reminds you, this is not all there is to these people, um, it actually has a very good impact. And it's kind of part of a way that, um, as an organization, a blade of grass tends to look at projects that find something they can say yes to. So that in a body of work uh, around homelessness, because certainly Jody cares about other homelessness, work that's right. leads towards yeah. policy change in homelessness, she cares a lot about it. She looks to where she fits in that whole ecosystem and this thing, what replenishes the people doing work like that. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's another good point I just want to hit on is that oftentimes when artists think about these kinds of projects, they think that uh, they have a hard time thinking about how they exist within a larger system, right? That yeah. I have to end homelessness. And then that becomes overwhelming. And that's why a lot of people don't do this kind of work because that that where Jody, I think the smart thing here is like, all right, here's this one way that I can um, take part in this. And also I realize that I'm part of other systems that can be improved that working together will move this forward. That's a really important point. And there's an opposite point because, you know, like in a, in, in a body of like 500 applications, one thing that you'll see is that there are a lot of artists who, who go ahead and decide that they can end homelessness, which has its own, uh, uh, pitfalls you know like well, that doesn't make a good project either yeah right like so i mean yeah I'm thinking, oh, God. well so we I'm go just, on to the next uh because we, so. we don't want that to be our only example yeah yes yeah yeah let's let's um talk about this one Salar Mendy. so on um, so on the total opposite end of the spectrum right like yeah. so Salar Mendy. uh another artist working in new york city uh this is a project called the journalero app she, it began as a, uh, as a part of Saul's uh, educational work with NICE, which is the new immigrant, uh, God, oh, I'm forgetting what it stands for. Community um, Empowerment? Probably Community, community Empowerment. Community Empowerment, thank Probably. you. Um, new Immigrant Community Empowerment Project. Can you see it bigger than I can? Because I was trying to read it in my- I can. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, moving on. So, so, uh, so she started by taking doing photography classes at Nice and uh, working with a group of people who, and and really thinking a lot with them by taking through photography about what their work environment is, what the challenges are that they face. Really, kind of thinking about like how to change their work environment in a very concrete way and what and what the workers came up with together using you know this kind of art class as a conduit is this idea that they need an app that tracks and 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 deals with wage theft right so the journalero app was designed by this group of of um, of day day laborers journalero is, is uh, spanish for day laborer and what it consists of oh here i'll, I'll stop you should talk. no 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 that's fine yeah. um the thing that was so interesting is almost all the the people in the workshop and almost all the day laborers have cell phones so they can take pictures and they can receive information so she knew that yeah. she works with them all the time um and and it seems that what everyone agreed is that sometimes someone will pull up with a truck and they'll hire three people and someone will say, oh, I know that person. That person never pays. Yeah. Or that person always mistreats um, the workers. And so with this app, you can right away send a signal, you know, at the corner of such and such and such and such, take a picture, try to get the license plate even, yeah. and identify the person. Or if you have gone to a place of work and it happens there, you take pictures. And so this now becomes a way to first in the immediacy alert other day laborers, but then more long term, um, solve partners with lawyers and people who work very, very, very a policy in a very policy oriented way about the conditions um, that day laborers work under and how to actually prosecute people who um, fall way below that bar. Right. 
So in this case, um, ultimately, the evaluation would be how many, this is a case in which we would, to do, a, to do good field research, to do great field research, I wouldn't say to do good, to do great field <laughs> research, we'd have to come back in at least a year and find out, okay, have you got the statistics? And they are gathering them. How many day laborers has this mm -hmm. helped? What have they found to be the challenges? Right. Um, and this thing about quantitative is actually very important to us. We look for what can be counted, but we don't assume we know what can be counted. Well, and we don't want to count the wrong thing, right? Because like, you know, numbers are just a part of telling the story. In the case of the Journalero app, it's really like, like numbers can help tell a really compelling story because a, a key function of the project is to collect data in order to move policy. The reason that people don't pay day laborers now is because a fine is is worth it, you know. Um, it, and so changing the law to ensure that it's not worth it um, is going to take a lot of information. And so, uh, yeah. So a project like this makes my little social science activisty heart go pitter pat, right? Yep. Um, but the other part of me says, and we've worked with Saul, and she's amazing. Um, Where's the art? Where's that affective care that sort of the like did this swing too far to the other side? And how does one, you know, when working with Sal say, okay, well, these are the metrics that you want to work with and so on and so forth. Can you ever work with the artist and say, maybe think of some other metrics that can actually enrich their project? Or how do you how do you work with that? Yeah, I mean, we do think about different metrics with different artists all the time. Um what I think in terms of the art, I think it's really important to underline that Saul got into this because she was teaching a photography workshop and she was really, in so first of all, there's the question of where is teaching in someone's artistic practice right? and who is it one wants to be in relationship with um, and she wants to be, she has a very long history of working with immigrants. She is an immigrant from Argentina. It's not the same situation um, as some immigrants, obviously we know that not all immigrants are treated equally, but she was very interested in what they perceive and how they perceive and how what their life experiences affects what they see. So it was very grounded in observation, perception, paying attention. It was also very grounded in the kind of trusting relationships she, she was able to build because she showed up. You know, sometimes there was money to pay her and sometimes there wasn't and she showed up so people trusted her. And these are people in yeah. a situation not to trust a lot of people. So that's not inconsequential. And it's not by accident that it's sometimes through an artistic relationship, but also makes a level playing field. The kind of conversations they could have around images and the interests. Oh, in interesting. Saw, yeah. It's very rich and multidimensional and people aren't just being seen as their worker self or their undocumented self. You're suddenly there 3D and it makes a big difference in being, feeling like someone who yeah. can help develop an app like this. Mm -hmm. The other point that you're, that you're kind of getting at, Steve, is, is this idea of like what's, what's art, right? Like, and I don't want to, I don't want to, go on too long about that, right? But, like, but I do, um, that's a different webinar, <laughs> maybe. Or a series. Uh, but well, maybe we should do that webinar. But okay, so, but no, but I will say that there are projects that, um, there are projects that are just always gonna be nothing. They're, they're, they're beautiful because they're just a little, they're just this little art project. Jody's is, project is a really good example of that. It's like a little pocket in reality, right? Um, Hakeem Bey calls it like a temporary autonomous zone, right? Um, there's, there are also projects that need a temporary autonomous zone for a brief period of time in order to become the new reality, right? And they're different. Um, and, and treating them the same is, is um, in an assessment context, doesn't make any sense, you know, like, because uh, uh, Saul's project is going to is going to pass through art and become uh, a way to shift policy, right? Like we have another project called Sex Ed uh, that is their goal is to is to use art as a way to start teaching sex ed differently because uh, because that's the only place we can do it right now. But the goal is to actually just change sex ed curriculum in public high schools in all public high schools. Yeah, I think it's funny that I mean, people use a curriculum as a good quantitative metric, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, 
I, I was just going to say, I think it's funny, like Steve and I over the years have kind of flipped places where Steve becomes the advocate for the art side. And I'm like, I love this because it's actually preventing day laborers from having their wages stolen. You know, like it's a real tool. Yeah. And, you know, he, he was, he came from activism. I came from art. Yeah. And You're in for both. That's why we're a team, Steve. Yeah. 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 But I think one of the things that I found with artists is a lot of them don't believe that they can have those or they, they don't think that's possible. So they never consider it. And what's mm -hmm. nice about this assessment thing and asking all these questions is that probably gets asked, right? Like, it's like, what do you really want to do? Let's actually take a look at this. You could achieve more than you believe. What, what do we want to like, where do we want to set our targets, which is what we're all about. Right. And can I just say one thing about that? Because, sure. uh, you know, it's great to have a Jan in your life, as everybody <laughs> knows. But, but you know, these are techniques that anybody can use. You can use them on yourself. You can use them in groups with other people. There's a great book. Um, is there a place to like write something down? Yeah, you know, Rebecca will yeah. help us. But like, there's a there's a great book by Richard Sager um, about collaborative action research. I think it's called collaborative action research and it is, um, uh, and it's just this really simple, um, and it's a really simple guide to learning how to kind of think through problem solving while you're doing the work. It's like an indispensable tool, I think, for artists who are thinking in these terms. And I'd also say in terms of, um, how do artists know that they can make art about anything? That's why, among the ways we support artists, yes, money is important. Money is important, but telling these stories is important. And looking yeah. for the different formats in between the the films. And now we're thinking about periodical. What might that look like? How do we talk to all the multiple audiences we want to talk with? Um, but here we have this wonderful image of Mary Mattingly Swale, and I actually wonder how did that picture get taken? I oh, that was a drone. Oh yeah. Oh. Um, and um, Mary worries about food being available in urban situations and there, there aren't like these open fields the way there are in rural contexts and she thought well what if we use the waterways New York City has lots of waterways and what if we involve lots of different sectors that it would take to pull this off so there were engineers involved in what kind of platform could hold what are in fact gardens they're growing veggies and fruits and what are gardens in New York where things could be started? The little sprouts, maybe school programs and, and greenhouses. And then we move them on to Swale, the boat, the ship, and we do educational programs. And it's a lovely place to sit. And it's when you sit in the midst of these fruits and vegetables growing with different people who might come on to the Swale um, because of where it's docked, you, it's, it's very, there's a very utopian component. They give away the fruit and vegetables on a small scale, but this is the world I want to live in where we make food together, we grow it, we make sure it's plentiful for everyone and it's available yeah. the different places we are. So like, you know, it's just some interesting numbers on the 60,000 people visit it, visit Swale every season and it's entering its third year in partnership with Partnerships for Parks. Um, it costs about a hundred thousand dollars to do every year. It's, um, you know, just, I mean, it's one of those, um, uh, it's one of those projects that is seeking, you know, to live in the world forever, you know, and, and be a public resource that does a very concrete thing, which is, which is act as a site of imagination. Can um, uh, follow up on that. Yeah. How do you measure blowing someone's mind that's a really good question um jan those are one's <laughs> mind uh, well we have lots of testimonial you know, right we, and yeah. we it, and we make it clear that this okay here's someone okay so if we again if we're talking about mary's project we've got engineers and educators and people who grow food and we tr i try to find sort of represent representative comments so that's one I don't know how do you do it. I, I'd love to hear well, more. It, it's a great question because if we if we if we really do it, we won't know for like ten years, right? Right. And, and that you know, the, if you think about sort of transformations in like how we think about political yeah. coming out of second wave feminism, it wasn't until fifteen years later that people were like, oh, we we fundamentally talk about politics differently. Conservative politicians talk about politics differently, and so I'm wondering like how you can trace these. Well, 
massive consciousness shifts about thinking about like food, for example, or care or things like that. Yeah, and can I kind of think about it? Like, so, so is it about proving that you've blown somebody's mind or is it about telling an effective, credible story about minds being blown? You well, know? I, think, I think that it's great to funders to be able to give anecdotes about people saying my mind is blown. But when we want to transform the world, we really want to know that it's happened. I can say I'm transformed, but that's different than me thinking a different way. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah at the same time, like, like, I don't know, there, like, there's this element of, um, I understand why you want this, Steve. At the same time, there's an element of humility and kind of, in kind of understanding that you'll never be able to prove when somebody's mind is blown and in kind of accepting that. What do you well, think? You've seen, you've seen our mathematical formula though, right? Yeah, yeah I have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that, that's why I'm, that's, yeah. We were, I think that there's a moment you can see visually sometimes where people, sometimes they, you, there's a path that you're taking them through, right? Yeah. And they're having this experience, whatever that experience is, they have a certain expectation and then something different happens and they can't speak for a minute. Right. Mm -hmm. They yeah. are without words. Like that's a way of measuring it. Yeah. But you know, like, but I would say that you can't, you, that's not a way of measuring it. That's a way of telling a story about it. You can tell a story. And, and, and that's the di distinction that I just want to just stick with is that like, you know, yeah. Jen is writing stories about these projects right. ultimately, you know, and that's like, why we call it research too. But I do look for indicators. I look mm -hmm. for, yeah, because it's only, people are fellows with us for only one year. That's really short. Right. In the big scheme of things, language. yeah. But in a year, we can get to a point, and I do try to get to it, where I say, do you see the engineers, the educators, and the foodies yeah. working with Mary Mattingly and various residents of New York City from all different ages and all different living situations who are drawn to this cool looking boat they're invited to come on and have a peach, you know? Yeah. And so I can say, what happens, how often does a group of people like this across silos actually get to interact together in a very pleasant, nice way? Mm -hmm. And where might that go? Mm -hmm. it's going this way this is all we can see in this short period of time but where might that go and there's a certain amount of that we look at sure yeah. so i'm gonna throw up um our question thing for the people our, our lovely folks that have joined us in the um in our audience there is a little place where you can enter in questions and a few of you have already entered questions and for uh, Deborah and Jan and Steve, what I'd suggest is let's take a look at some of those questions. And if there's a, you had some other projects you wanted to show, if there's a project that helps illustrate what we're talking about in answering the question, I can pull that up. Just tell me um, what to put up. So we've got one from Allie, and um, this is uh, for you, Jan. It's I'm interested to know how much of the evaluation process Jan is involved in with artist projects is about speaking to the people who are involved as participants and communities who take part and how their voices feed into that ongoing reflective criticisms on artists' projects. Yeah, yeah, great questions. That is definitely, it's a basic premise of the work. Yeah. It's who benefits, who are the multiple participants in the multiple positions who are meant to get something out of this, and so you have to hear from them, are yeah. you? So, um, so a lot to answer the question. How much? A lot. <laughs> I would say 75% or more. Well, because the artist is there too. Yeah. yeah. So here's a follow-up question from Julia is like, how does the artist inform what the evaluation is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you want, so, I can throw up a picture if you have a, an example that could go with this. Let me know. Uh, let's see, what are our, well, I don't know, maybe Rick? No, we don't no, have a picture. We don't have that picture after, sorry. Um, well, no, we just, let's just talk. Okay. The, um, you know, I, I will, how about this? I think it's Dreads is a good example. Huh? Would dreads be a good example? Sure, why not? Okay. Um, no, actually, it's a terrible example. But this I is kidding? a great project. Um, Never so, mind. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, like, so I think that, that the best examples of this are actually, um, you know, like sex, sex ed is a really good example, right? Like in comparing it to something like, you know, sex ed was a, you, you talk, it's your evaluation. Well, that's okay. Um, yeah, it's very, it's the, 
we begin with the artist because it's the artist who's made a proposal that's been accepted and that's why they're our fellow. So we begin knowing what are their goals. And then I have a conversation, I have a number of conversations with them, but off the bat, what are some of the things they want to find out? How can having me also observing, witnessing what's going on, how can I help them find that out? What is it I can help them learn about that, that people are experiencing um, it, it, the reason Dred Scott's project is a difficult one is because I didn't, I didn't, uh, I was not the field researcher because this is a multi-year project and it's still in this um, early phase, as far as I understand, yeah. of whispering secretively, getting people to participate in New Orleans in what will be a reenactment of a slave, of a, of a rebellion. And so I know numbers matter to him, you know, just from hearing him talk about the project. Yeah. And I know that the process, how people get involved, because it's he also wants very to, important. yeah, he wants to, he wants people to have that experience of this other way of getting pulled into but, a project. Yeah. But I mean, I think that an interesting way to think about the question is actually that, um, you know, artists walk into um, collaborations with a blade of grass with very different goals, right? Like, so... Um, you know, for a, for an, a project like Jody's or Plugin Studio or uh, Laura Chipley's project, well, no, Laura Chipley's not a good example of this. Uh, the primary thing was like, tell me it's art. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like it's like, a good example uh, because it was with teenagers. Yeah, it's and like, so a lot of people they see you're working with young people and they pat you on the head and they say that it's an education project. So they were like, no, 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 tell me it's art. And then uh, we had um, somebody like Sex Ed. And their their goal was like, we're going to get a National Science Foundation grant to turn this into real curriculum. Like those are you write those reports very differently, don't you, Jen? Yeah, yeah. And and in fact, that's one of the interesting developments is who's the audience. We do two reports. We do a mid an interim and then a final. And we were working with um, Mark Strandquist and Courtney Ryle. Oh, Courtney Bowles. Bowles. Um, they work with getting, helping people get rid of the paper trail from being incarcerated. And they realized that for this, their second report, as much as they liked their field researcher who wrote about it as an art project, they wanted someone who could write about it as a legal strategy mm -hmm. that could be brought to um, City Hall right. and argued. And so we found, with their help, we found a lawyer who appreciates a broad range of what one can do through art, and she wrote the second report. So and this, some, yeah. yeah, this is a great segue to the next question that's up. Cynthia asks, how does one convey the validity of these artistic narratives to other scholars and policymakers who lean more toward more traditional notions of social research? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Using you, you know, like sometimes it's about adopting their language. Sometimes it's about um, you know the work that we do for the Department of Cultural Affairs has to has to uh, you have to consider the audience, right? Like so, so the Department of the assessments for the Department of Cultural Affairs have an audience of the artist, the uh, collaborators in the um, in the department that that's being collaborated with, right? Like say the Department of Probation. And then you've also got uh, decision makers at a very high level, right? Like, so we need to have an exa in addition to a detailed narrative that will help the people who are really doing the work. We also need an executive summary that is like one paragraph long, you know, That's and that has time gonna take and that has bullet points and that really is organized entirely around make these decisions. Yeah, you know, and there will also be readership. Uh, that's a project that's focusing on um, the relationship, which is which the Pro Office of Probation says is is a relationship that needs a lot of help. That's why they want an artist working with them. But the relationship between probation officers and clients, it will be very important to feed back to them what we learn at the end of that. Uh, that's right. one of our pair projects with the city. Um, yeah. Because it's very great. Talk. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question because um, one of the things is like if you're trying to figure out how to talk to people that have more tradition than old notions of social research or institutions, you're in kind of a lucky position, right? Because that means. You're, that means they're listening to you. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah. If those people aren't listening to you, if you're just making this work, um, so I have a question for the audience. One is, what are the metrics that you use? What, how do you evaluate your own work? What have, what things have you come across that help? And then my question for you, while we wait for those to come in, are all right. I don't have 
Jan Cohen Cruz over my shoulder, unfortunately, how do I do this myself, right? Like, how do I, if I don't have an external evaluator, that's develop a methodology. Yeah. So that's, do do yeah. So that's why I, I suggested that people read the Sager book because it's basically, it's, it's a very concrete uh, how to book about action research as a methodology by incorporating this into your and, and it was developed by Richard Sager as a teacher and he was actually responding to the idea that teachers get told um, what their what metrics are by people who teach teachers how to teach right like and so he was actually trying to reclaim power by um, by creating a methodology by which teachers could could um, uh, research themselves right so like so that is that's the answer the Richard Sager book. I'd say the Richard Sager book in combination with one's own experience. Yeah, um, a, a, you know because I used to do theater in my youth. Um, there are a lot of things I learned about what how I, how I evaluated what I thought was good and what I was doing and what I thought wasn't good and my peers because I was really immersed in that world, and I bring that firsthand experience to everything I learned from books like the participatory action research, people like Pam and Barb and other really good evaluators out there. It's a much more reciprocal evaluation, conversational. Yeah. I've got another book that I have my students work with and, I, and I've seen it in Steve's office too. It's called The Craft of Research. Yeah. It's about how you come up with a, um, you know, if you're writing a thesis paper, like I've got these things that I sort of, these topics that I'm compelled by and then how you filter that into an actual question and how you answer those questions and come yeah. up with evaluations. It's really good. The other thing I'll quickly say is that Steve and I have written a book that will come out eventually that also talks about this. That's um, great. Yes. I love Cynthia's follow-up question there. My experience has been that they tend to view these narrative methodology as not real research, oral history, for right. instance. Yes, I've certainly encountered that. Of course, you're right. I think the the fact there's so much cross uh, sector work right now is in our favor, you know, like the fact that we're in a position to write about the arts for the city, but it's for the arts and the mayor's office of immigration or the arts and probation. That's a good move to have these opportunities. Art Place offers opportunities yeah. where arts are being embedded in economic development. And so you're going to have people from both looking at it together and working together so it's an opportunity so so like so so there's this moment of opportunity and i think that it that has to meet rhetorical skills that are really like you know um like we edit jan and i edit the department of cultural affairs papers together because i'm better at speaking one language and she's better at speaking another language for example right like so so there's also a strong rhetorical component here yeah, you have to speak in a convincing way. To, to the artists out there and activists out there who want to start this sort of self-assessment, what is the first and most important question they need to ask themselves? A really good question. Where, what, I, what do you think? I mean, goal, we start with goals. goals. Okay. We, again, it, it's what we discussed earlier. It's, it's so much about context. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know what your goals are, then you can say, okay, how will I know? What do I have to see to know that I'm reaching yeah. those goals? Yeah. Um, and then saying, well, what do I see? Right. And I think it's good. I like this idea of peer to peer. It's hard to assess yourself or, yeah. or to write about yourself because you partly see what you want to see because you see the vision of what you right. want it to become. Yeah. So get someone, and, and this is one of the, the other things I think is worth saying. Um, we've sometimes had field researchers who are close to the artists they're writing about, and in the in the world that Cynthia was uh, speaking about, that's a no-no. You know, they're too close. And you need distance. And the fact is, some of the best uh, field researchers have been people who know the artists very well. They're very rigorous. They want them to, to succeed. They know what to harp on. And they've been some. Uh, they, I cannot say that being too close has meant that they've been less critical. Yeah. But I, I just want to back up because like I think you said something really important, but it's so normal to you, but I just want to extract it, which is you said the most important thing is to ask what their goals are. But then you said, and how will you know if you've met those goals? Yeah. And, and then what are you seeing around you? And those three steps are really important, right? You know, yeah. this is what I want to have happen. 
how will I know it's happened? And yeah. then what's actually happening? That's and that's, right. you know, we can elaborate that, but that's, that seems to me like a great formula. And then once you say what's actually happening, then there's a couple of decisions. Therefore, do I want to do, as you call course correction, which I hate using that phrase right now with the stock market, but of course, <laughs> we want, does that mean that, oh, was I wrong? What I thought my goals were, that actually yeah. wasn't, or given the situation, this is what I can do with this project here, or, right. or who knows what you might say, but you have to stop and be critical and allow yourself to think, oh, what does that mean as far as where I go next? That's very hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to read some of these here because there's a few good ones. Zoe just sent yeah. one in about how uh, that uh, many consider Occupy Wall Street to have been a failure, but it changed the terminology and dialogue nationwide. So initially and shortly after it was of dubious impact, but I, um, but I do think it helped shape the direction of discussions. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one here, Peter, our, our, our friend Peter Mala. I've been thinking about how if I encourage someone to tweet my action, I might be able to better measure their attitudes before and after an action, right? So it's like a way of them sort of saying what they think and doing it in a public way and serves two things at once. Um, Ali says, uh, recently evaluated a long-term project in Govan Hill, partly through inviting a local master's students to come along and both mm -hmm. observe and participate and use Jan's four questions outlined in her, in her Beyond Imagination article has been one of the most beneficial evaluations of my work we've ever done. Well, That's you. awesome. That's so sweet. Can yeah. we get a link to that, Jan? Uh, just aw. <laughs> um, um, so, Lucia <laughs> says. Say the language, I actually wanted to respond, uh, Steve, to the other Steve, to the language terminology issue. And that, to me, is a good example of if you look back at a project and you say, OK, here's the goals we thought we had. What actually happened? And then you say, oh, we have a language to talk about something that we didn't have as good a language to talk about. Right. So how do you recognize that? And I think it's, I find the more I have someone thoughtful to talk with, artists, participants, Deborah, that is so helpful. I don't do this alone. What my, my best work I do with other people being in conversation because I, you know, I have my blind spots too, as much as I try not to. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have this thing, I probably said this before, but uh, I would I I will call my mom or like family that's sort of older that doesn't know this world and like run the thing by them and if they're like I don't know what you're talking about I have to go and redo it. We call that in the office. We have we call that the mom test. And and uh, every single thing we write we try to run by the mom test. Yeah yeah. Um, so Lucia here, uh, we should wrap up soon, but responses yeah. on social media interaction after sharing documentation materials created as part of the work, comments and interaction on posts, news and articles, responses from different audiences, for example, activations over academic driven forums, conferences, scholarly articles and or socially engaged forums, activating work in a social protest or any other kind of activity. She's talking about a sort of audience that might be favorable. I like that that came just after the mom thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think running it by an audience too that isn't as familiar might not immediately see it as favorable can also give you a sense if that's your audience, right? Of how it's working. If, if it's not, well, it's then it's you, don't need you know, yeah, like it's, it's also looking at how it changes the discussion. Yeah. You know, and how you can actually find markers for that a year out, two years out, and so on. Yeah. So um let we should wrap up. Um I know we could talk about this. Maybe we could do a part two because you yeah. have these other examples, and I think sometimes just looking at examples also is really helpful. So we could we could plan that if you two don't mind. It sounds yeah. like you're, you're yes. very popular. Um, yeah. So I've got some links here. This is uh, the Blade of Grass site, and and these you have a lot of resources there. Like I've I, there's a um, papers and discussions that are talked about. I wrote an article for you that we had a big discussion about. Um, and so that's the Blade of Grass site, and we can see some of that research and project examples and the application for the fellowship, right? One of the coolest things we have is we have a feature called Reports from the Field. It's very regular, and it's exactly, you know, like participants speaking about their experience with projects. It's some of the most fun content we have. That's great. That's great. Um, also, um, we have a few of these prints left. This is like our end of the year fundraising thing. Um, it's, uh, should I explain it? It's, uh, it's, um, 
the suffragette march that happened in 1915. And um, we added the little imagine winning here. These suffragettes knew how to create a spectacle and you can put this on your wall and remind you um, they're at the treasury building in Washington, DC to imagine winning. Rebecca, thank you, 1913. So we have a few of those left um, and you, you know, we put the webinars out for free. If you can help us out and make a donation, it makes a difference. And then um, we have to second that. Yes, definitely donate. <laughs> Thank you, board member. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we have uh, a webinar coming up next week, and we're going to kind of step back a little bit. Um, it's about how change actually happens. We always talk about that arts and activism can change the world, but what do we actually mean when we say things like that? What? How does it change the world? Um, we're going to talk about sort of an ideal way of thinking about the world, a material way of thinking about how social change happens. But what happens when you have the very pragmatics of activism and the sort of, you know, the affective strength of expressive arts? How do we imagine change actually happening? So we're going to have sort of a philosophical discussion about that, but then going to get really into the practical and pragmatics about once you've actually figured out what is your theory of change, it really helps you to think about where am I going to intervene into the social struggle and what is my work going to do or what do I want my work to do? So please come on back uh, next week. And um, I just want to say thank you again and again to Jan Cohen Cruz and Deborah Fisher, who are these amazing resources for our community. And thanks for spending your time with us. And thank you to everybody who came out to the webinar. Um, you know, go out there, be creative. Yeah. And measure your impact in most importantly in a way that's meaningful to you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We'll see Bye. you next time. Okay. See you later.